This is the Matrox Parhelia APVE. If you are at all familiar with Matrox history and the last great gaming send-off of the company that came in the form of the Parhelia, you'll know that the Parhelia primarily came in the form of AGP cards, with a PCIe-X version available for certain customers. This PCIe card, however, is a little different from its relatives, and not just because of the aftermarket cooling that's installed on it. Now, before I continue, if you aren't familiar with Matrox or the Parhelia and would like to learn more, both Phil's Computer Lab and Budget Builds Official have some really awesome videos exploring the Parhelia a little more. Highly recommend those. Getting back to the APVE, this version of the Parhelia is not just the original card on a PCIe bus. It actually uses a cut-down version of the Parhelia die, specifically the MPA4, a revision of the Parhelia LX architecture that would go on to power Matrox offerings for the next decade. Compared to the Barhelia that we all know and love, the MPA4 has half the texture mapping units, half the pixel shaders, half the vertex shaders, and half the ROPs. Additionally, the APVE sports a 25MHz higher core clock than the standard Barhelia, at 250MHz up from 225, but has a lower out-of-the-box memory clock, at only 250MHz compared to the original Barhelia's 275. The memory bus has also been cut down to 128-bit from the original Parhelia's 256-bit bus, drastically reducing memory bandwidth. Compared to its predecessor of just four years earlier, the Parhelia APVE seems to be a direct downgrade, and in many ways, it is. The APVE did not come in a 256 megabyte flavor unlike some AGP or PCIe-X Parhelias, and the APVE also has a heavily cut down version of the GPU compared to its predecessor. The only advantages it seems to have out of the box are the PCIe support and a slightly higher core clock. We'll have to see if we can do something to close the gap a little bit sometime later. The system we'll be testing the card with is as follows. A Lenovo ThinkCenter motherboard with an AMD Athlon 64X2 dual core 3800+, plus clocked at 2 GHz, with 4GB of DDR2 and a 2x2GB configuration, inside of an old Dell Inspiron case, with a Delta DPS 475 CB power supply that has been repinned to work with the ATX standard. Going back to the card, I decided to upgrade its cooling. Originally, it used the same relatively small heatsick and fan combo of the original Parhelia, not too abnormal for the time period, Affixed to the die with two pushpin clips and a really strong thermal adhesive, I had to warm up a little before it could be removed. For the replacement, I mounted a 650Ti cooler I acquired on eBay for a few dollars shipped, trimmed and adjusted to fit on the APVE before being mounted with two screws, and the fan wired in to available 5 volts on the board. Looks quite alright I think, and it certainly does a better job helping to cool the APVE. Although I don't have exact temperature readings, as this card doesn't report temperature, nor is it detected by most monitoring software besides SIB32. For the thermal paste, I used this HY510, pretty much the bargain bin stuff you can find on eBay from China, but it's really affordable in bulk and does a fine job when applied in spread. Really not that much worse compared to other average thermal paste, it's not like we're going out for uh, thermal grizzly or anything like that. For the memory, I originally didn't add cooling to those as the cart originally didn't come with any cooling on them besides the fan's airflow, but I later added thermal pads to connect them to the new heatsink and was actually able to get higher stable memory clocks than what I benchmarked with. So I do recommend cooling those chips if you can. Once the cooler was upgraded, I set to overclocking using PowerStrip version 3.9, the latest available. I went up in increments before settling on a safe and stable overclock on the core of 275MHz and on the memory of 330MHz. I could push both of these a little bit further, 
but I begin running into issues with either stability or weird graphical glitches, and really I'd rather not run the card at the borderline for now. I think this overclock represents a pretty safe bet for what you could get out of one of these cards, so that's what we'll be sticking with for the remainder. Testing the overclock settings in 3D Mark 03, we get 635 3D Marks, a pretty healthy increase compared to the stock results of 506 3D Marks. Not bad. Before benchmarking further, it's worth taking a look at some of the driver features. Matrox's driver suite, known as PowerDesk, is quite nice, I think, offering a lot of customizability for monitor setup and application adjustments. I'll have to see about getting analog composite output from the card at some point to test its TV output alongside dual monitors. I think that's a really cool feature. Looking at the game optimizations we can make, the biggest option is the ability to force 16x fragment anti-aliasing or even 4x super sampling. Really awesome features to clean up the low resolution images this card will normally spit out in gaming. Generally, 16x FAA is what we'll be going with, as that strikes a nice balance between performance and image quality. There are also options for reporting OpenGL capabilities differently, probably in relation to the Parhelia architecture's lack of full DX9 or OpenGL 1.4 and up support. The first game that we'll be taking a look at is Star Wars Battlefront from 2004. Both this game and Star Wars Battlefront 2 needed 3D Analyze to force software transform and lighting, not so the game would work, but so the game just loaded up in a reasonable amount of time. Seems like a bug with Matrox's TNL implementation on this card, I don't really know. Anyway, once we got into the game, testing on Bespin platforms at 800x600 with lowest settings, we were able to achieve an average of 42 FPS with a minimum of 20 FPS. I would say so long as you stay away from the heavier mod maps for Battlefront 1, you'd have a decent time with the APVE in this game, although it will fluctuate on a map to map basis. Next up was, of course, Classic Battlefront 2 at 800x600 all lowest, and on most maps it ran just fine, similarly or even better than Battlefront 1 in many instances. However, something you'll probably notice in gameplay in both this and Battlefront 1 is how poorly the card seems to handle particle effects where it sometimes slows the game down to a crawl for a split second. Still, the game renders just fine and is pretty enjoyable at an average of 42 FPS and a minimum of 22 FPS, very similar to Battlefront 1. Just as before, there's a lot of variance in the custom content available for Battlefront 2, so some maps will likely work better than others. Sidmere's Pirates ran mostly fine in the initial test run at 640x480 lowest with an average of 53 FPS and a minimum of 0 FPS from the transition screens. Although at first I experienced a um, minor issue. Yeah, we'll call it a minor issue. Not only that, but the game seemed a bit unstable, crashing at seemingly random intervals for no reason at all. I did, however, later fix both of these issues with these 3D Analyze settings I'm throwing up on the screen right now, and I added 16x Fragment Anti-Aliasing without that much of a performance hit. I suspect the problems I experienced are related to the Matrox drivers and how they're handling OpenGL and DirectX, not really sure. LEGO Star Wars 2 at 640x480 with 16x FAA also ran mostly fine except for a similar issue to Sid Meier's Pirates. Guy doesn't look like he's doing so good. I didn't get around to retesting the game with the same settings I applied to Pirates, but in any case the game was mostly playable in most of the scenes, with an average frame rate of 51 FPS with a minimum down to 27 FPS in the benchmark run. Jedi Knight 2 Jedi Outcast ran superbly at 640x480 with a mixture of low and medium settings and 16x fragment anti-aliasing, achieving a splendidly high average FPS of 89 and minimum down to 73 FPS. The 16x FAA really looks fantastic in this game, and the Matrox drivers even included a profile for it by default. 
I've played through most of the game on this card at this point, and it's really just a stellar experience, just as fun as ever. And actually, comparing to the stock clocks, uh, we do actually get an increase of around 10 FPS on the average, so I do recommend playing this overclocked on the card. Another great game experience was actually the 2000 port of Galaga to the PC by King of the Jungle Limited. I found this game at a thrift store a while back for a dollar, and I gotta say was honestly surprised with how far the developers went to deliver a unique 3D take on the Galaga experience. It starts out pretty standard like any Galaga game, until all of a sudden on the second stage it turns into a weird version of Star Fox. Running with 16x FAA at 640x480, the game's maximum resolution and settings, we stuck around at the frame rate cap of 30 FPS with minimums only ever dropping to 29. I'd actually recommend checking this port out of Galaga if you want to. It's pretty interesting and honestly I had a good amount of fun with it. Testing out the PC port of the PSP homebrew title Nazi Zombies Portable that was built on the Quake engine. If you're trying to get your Nazi Zombies fix on the Parhelia APVE, you'll be able to get it. I mean, with averages well over 100 FPS and minimums only ever dropping below that in really intense scenes, this game works absolutely fine, and that's not really surprising running at 640x480 with Fragment anti-aliasing on. Deus Ex, that wonderful gem of a game that came out years before the Parhelia APVE, to no surprise ran absolutely fine, with an average of 59 FPS and a minimum of 44 in the benchmark run on Liberty Island. Sure, later in the game with more demanding scenes this might drop a little, but I'd say that at 640x480 with Fragment Anti-Aliasing on, you'll have a fine experience playing through Deus Ex on this card. It's not that fast-paced of a game, and it works just fine. Now we begin to approach a bit rougher territory for the APVE. With the original Call of Duty at 640x480 lowest settings, the game was playable, but with a lot of fluctuation in frame rate depending on the exact scene the card was rendering. Still, in the benchmark run at Red Square, a pretty demanding scene, the card averaged 62 FPS with a minimum of 35 FPS, with those lower frame rates in open areas and higher in the interior areas, but more intense scenes later in the game might see these figures drop some or just wildly fluctuate. Still, not a bad experience, I would be able to play through Call of Duty on this card. The follow-up, Call of Duty 2, was not a great experience as it didn't even launch with the APVE, reporting that the card or driver did not support alpha blending. I did use Swift Shader 2.0 to get the game to launch, but that's pretty much software rendering and to say the least the performance was not great and it didn't even render the game completely properly not really too shocking considering the shortcomings of this card but still kind of disappointing doom 3 another classic was up next and it ran about as expected worse than the original parhelia to some extent with the same graphical glitches but still mostly playable with an average on the overclock card of 39 FPS and a minimum of 16. Although I will say in a lot of gameplay, you are going to see those dips into the 20s and even high teens. But with the slower pace of Doom 3, this is still largely playable and the game renders just fine. It's still the Doom 3 experience. You're still going to be able to play this game on the Parhelia APVE. Switching on over to Doom Slayer's Testaments, a mod for the Quake Spasm engine inspired by recent Doom 2016 and Doom Eternal titles, we actually did not get the performance that I was expecting out of this card. We only averaged 37 FPS in the benchmark run, with a minimum of 21 FPS. And in a faster paced game like this, I would hesitate to call this a good experience on the APBE. Honestly kind of surprising, I thought it would run this a bit better after seeing how this game ran on a card like the Realism 800, but we're seeing those limitations of just what the Parhelia APVE is able to put out. Another game that struggled a little bit on the Matrox Parhelia APVE was Age of Empires 3. It's a little bit of a black sheep in the Age of Empires series, kind of like Empire Total War in the Total War series, 
but it's still pretty fun and it would be nice to see it run well on this card. And when running at stock clocks, we barely average 30 FPS and overclocked, we're averaging around 37 to 40-ish FPS with a minimum of around 30 FPS with some drops into the high 20s. And this is running at lowest settings and a low resolution without fragment anti-aliasing. So the game is pretty crusty looking. Still, you can get your Age of Empires fix on this card, it just won't be the most stellar experience. And finally, to round things out, we have Far Cry, the crisis of its day. And just like on the original Parhelia, it runs, kind of. I mean, in terms of average frame rate, we're getting a really good average frame rate at 800 by 600 lowest settings with fragment anti-aliasing on of around 60 FPS, not really ever dropping below 40-ish. But, you know, you have problems with uh, the terrain not rendering properly. So that kind of makes the game not really playable. Still, it's better than how I've seen some Parhelias render this, which is with no terrain at all. Still, not, uh, not the ideal experience on the APBE, which is kind of disappointing to see. Makes me wonder if it would even be able to run Crisis in DX9 mode since it's not fully DX9 compliant. Maybe that's something to test later on. So that does it for the tests of the Matrox Parhelia APVE, at least at this time. And what do we conclude from this? Is the Parhelia APVE a great option for a retro gaming card? I mean, no, no, not, not really. If you want fast performance, you know, you could pick up a cheap 8800 GTS and you'd be flying in most Windows XP games. But the value of the Parhelia APVE comes from its availability, the Parhelia APVE, the Millennium P650, and similar cards, they're pretty commonplace uh, compared to trying to track down an AGP or PCIX version of the Parhelia, and those are typically going to be more expensive than you can pick up an APVE for. What's interesting about the Parhelia APVE is you get that Matrox driver set, you get that interesting look at a third GPU maker, and What's really a shame is that looking back on Matrox, one can't help but wonder what could have been. Because the Parhelia was honestly a really cool architecture, and it's really cool to see things like 16x fragment anti-aliasing built into the driver, 4x super sampling on a card this old. As for myself, I'll probably keep using this card in my retro gaming machine because honestly, it's pretty interesting and it gives a pretty period correct feeling, a nostalgic feeling and experience in a lot of these older titles that not great performance, but still plenty good for a lot of the experiences that I want to have on my retro gaming machine. Should you pick one of these cards up? Probably not, unless you have an interest in Matrox or just having a retro third GPU maker card in your system. They're certainly interesting for that. They're fascinating cards, and you know, there are even better cards that Matrox put out later on built off of the same architecture, like the Matrox M9148, I believe, that had different memory configurations, more memory, faster memory, that might be worth exploring and even pushing further to see if we can get even better performance out of the Matrox architecture. It's a shame that Matrox no longer produces these cards, but you know, really, they weren't stellar cards, and if you're looking just to have a stellar retro gaming experience, I'd look elsewhere. But they're fascinating and they have their place in history for a reason. Maybe with Intel's art cards we'll be seeing a better third GPU maker on the horizon, but you know, only time will tell. In any case, I hope you've enjoyed exploring the Matrox Parhelia APVE. Thanks for watching.